Um, so we'll get right into this. Um, so my name is Mike Reed. Um, I work full time for a production company in Rhode Island right now. Um, I really, uh, really like uh, writing educational articles, giving presentations and things. Um, main reason is it helps me understand it. If I can try to teach it to people, then at odds are I'll be able to um, to understand it better myself. Um, I built this calculator uh, just as a tool for myself. Um, basically something that I noticed was coming up um, on job sites and I figured, hey, if I can do this in a way where all I have to do is enter a couple variables and the, and the information is instantly there, um, that's going to save me a lot of time and it's going to help me out. So I'm calling this thing for the sake of the presentation, the room mode plus calculator. When you, when you go download it uh, from the Google website, um, call it whatever you want. It, it doesn't matter. Uh, I'm not trying to sell it or market it. It's just, it's just a name. And as you, as you'll find out, it's, it's, it's more than just room modes. And, um, but the common theme for all the parameters that it's going to show you is that they're all based on the dimensions of the room. Um, so this uh this thing will open in a, in a lot of programs uh excel is one of them um apache open office uh is a free like similar to office uh suite of tools that it will work on uh google sheets if you upload it there it's the same thing and i've not confirmed with like my own eyes that it'll work on the mac version of excel uh, but I think it does. I'm pretty sure it, sh it should be fine. Um, so you can convert it however you want. Uh, freely share it. It's, it's, not, it's not anything proprietary. I, I got all this um, formulas and everything from our books that were already published. Um, okay, so this will be the first disclaimer. Uh, there'll be two disclaimers um, about how this thing works tonight. Uh, this will be the first one. This only works, it's only accurate uh, for a rectangular or a, like a square slash cubic room. You've got a fan-shaped hall, you've got something with a, an L shape in it. Even if you have a pitched ceiling, um, it's not going to be accurate. And that's just, just how the math works. Um, you can get pretty close, close enough. Uh, with something with like a pitched roof, um, I I remember using this in a at a job at this old armory in the town I live in, and um, even though the the pitched roof uh, was there, it was it it was still close enough. So we'll we'll see why it's close enough later, but um, pretty much it's gonna be spot on for rectangle, and and nothing else. Um, so, all right, so here is the first section. It's the top left section. Um, the instructions are fill out the gray and blue boxes. You'll see the blue box later on. Um, so here you go. Here's your variables. Uh, length, width, and height, real simple uh, for the room. Um, <clears throat> these uh, little notes over here telling you to use the longest dimension for length and the shortest dimension for height. Um, that is because... It's going to calculate some extra things, and if you have them, it it, it will still work uh, for the like the critical frequency, um, no matter what order you have them in, because that's based on volume. But a couple of the other things, like highest axial mode and the speaker matching uh, section, it will get screwed up if you don't do this right. So, for the most part, um, the length is is going to be it, like. Most rooms aren't square or cubic, especially, well, coming from where I come from is I live in hotel ballrooms. So uh, for the most part, the height's going to be the shortest dimension. And, and that's that's how it's going to work. Um, so there's a couple things that I'll just go briefly over uh, here that it's going to show you. One is going to be the volume of the entire room, cubic feet. Um, then this is the surface area section in square feet. Uh, the mean free path. Uh, I'll get to the definition of that later. It's going to show that critical frequency is what we're most um, is probably the most important thing that we're going to be looking at. 
and uh, cutoff is another thing. I'll get the, into the definition in a minute in the highest axial mode. Um, so this is all the things in the first section. Um, so just as uh, just so you know that all the um, math, almost all the math in this uh, calculator comes from this book here, Acoustics and Psychoacoustics, um, fourth edition by Howard and Angus. And uh, I highly recommend looking through this if you want um, an acoustics book that isn't like a hundred feet over your head. I mean, I, I've read a lot of acoustics books and uh the equations in there you know some some of these things are just incredible it's pages and pages of equations this book for whatever reason the way they present it and the way it's laid out um i was able to easily just code everything into excel um because it it's it it made sense to me um okay so here's the part where it talks about um length width and height um, again use the longest dimension uh, for length and try to use the shortest dimension for the height most of the hotel ballrooms or rectangular rooms are going to have this anyway um, it's only going to work in feet uh, i do have a metric version but it's not as full featured it doesn't have everything that this thing does um, if if there's a demand i will personally send you the metric one if you want it um, I know you got a lot of you guys um, elsewhere in the world besides the United States um, obviously use the metric system a lot more than I will. Um, so just just find me on LinkedIn or send me an email or something, and I, I will send it to you if you want it. Um, there's just a couple of constants that are changed. That's the only difference. Um, okay, so the calculator, we talked about this. We'll give you the volume of the room, total surface area. Uh, this little thing called the mean free path is kind of an interesting uh, acoustic uh, parameter and it's the measure uh, of the average distances between all surfaces in the room assuming all possible angles of incidence and position so this is what's going to be used to calculate the next thing which uh, again is what this whole project started as something to calculate the critical frequency and the critical frequency is the approximate frequency at which there's a transition in the acoustic behavior of the room the region of modal behavior transitions to the region of diffuse behavior. Um, so if, if we look in the, uh, the little graphic here, because uh, sound frequencies have certain wavelengths um, that it takes for them to uh, complete a cycle, depending on the length of the wavelength, if that um, is sympathetic to the dimensions of the room, you're going to get, depending on where you stand and where the speaker source is or sub, uh, you're going to get big peaks in energy um, or big dips in energy. Um, and it's, it's spotty, it's predictable, but it's all over the place. And, um, and it's good to know about this uh, for several reasons we'll get into. Um, so this frequency is not, it, it's, it's like a knee, it's like a threshold, so to speak. It's not exact, and you'll see in the next uh, in the next graphic, um, but it's kind of the general shifting point, and um, it's really good to know this. So, uh, the other things that this first section will um, show you is the cutoff frequency. Now, this is the frequency range below the lowest resonance. Uh, in this region, the room is smaller than half a wavelength in all dimensions. Okay, and the results, uh, and that results in reduced sound levels at those frequencies. So if we go back, you can see here is the cutoff frequency, and this is going to be your lowest um, mode or interaction with the lengths of the room. It's not. It, it's. It might be good for you to know um, if you want to throw this calculator up for like your home studio or something, because that it'll actually be in a range that matters to you. I can say that most um, large bar rooms and stuff, the cutoff frequency is like three hertz. So it, it's kind of irrelevant, but I wanted to keep to put it in there anyway. Um, okay, and then, so this is, uh, this is the first uh, mind-bending part of this thing. Um, so another parameter that it's going to show you uh, is the highest axial mode. That's three times the shortest dimension of the room. Now, most of the time, this is going to be the ceiling. 
Um, but it, it's also a strongest form of a mode because it's an Axio. So you, you might want to know about this because um, the potential there is for feedback. Um, let's see. Uh, now, okay, so what's weird about this is this could possibly be, this, this frequency that this highest axial mode lives at could possibly be higher than your critical frequency, which kind of doesn't make sense, but it does make sense. The reason it works out like that is because, again, the mean free path uh, is an average distance between all the surfaces. So if you have a really long and really wide room, but the ceiling's only eight feet tall, that strong axial mode between the floor and the ceiling um, is going to be higher in frequency uh, because that distance is uh, less than the average distance. Kind of confusing, but you'll see going going forward. Um, okay, so this is another um, operational uh, issue with this. Um, word about ceiling height. Now, a drop ceiling, which you may you're going to encounter a lot um, in ballrooms and things. Um, it could it could introduce error into the calculation if you're not real deliberate with what you're doing. Um, so the long wavelengths, like the ones that cause the modal tendencies, they're going to pass right through a quarter inch or half inch drop ceiling with no problem. I've measured it. I've stuck on a microphone up above a drop ceiling, run a sine sweep, and uh, down at 80 hertz. 80 hertz doesn't care about the drop ceiling. It's going to go right through it. Um, the reason this is important is when you're trying to find the critical frequency, okay, you need to measure, uh, well, you need to measure from the floor to the structural ceiling. And the reason is uh, if the structural ceiling is higher, it's like say the structural ceiling has got six feet on the uh, drop ceiling, that's going to increase the mean free, free path quite a bit. And in turn, that's going to shift the critical frequency. Okay, so. Uh, on the other hand, um, the last section of the calculator does a reverb time for the room. And when you're measuring reverb time of frequency, something really high like 8K, um, in that case, you should use the drop ceiling as your height measurement because 8K's really short wavelengths are going to reflect right off those tiles. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll get into why um, that's important as well later on. So um, for a little more detailed look uh, at this kind of uh, operational issue, um, you can go on to prosoundweb.com and search, is, the, is a drop ceiling the acoustical ceiling? And that article goes a deep dive into that. And uh, it's, it's also on my LinkedIn page too. Okay, so here is, um, here's the example room. I just picked some not so random dimensions, but for our, for our purposes, they're, they're random. Um, so we're going to start with a 50 foot long, 32 foot wide and 12 foot high room. Um, what's nice about the calculator, just the Excel coding is that you don't actually, it's not like a, an acoustic prediction program where you have to put something in, click calculate and wait. It literally just, it starts calculating as you're entering things in. So one thing I forgot to mention before, um, before I started, uh, talking, it's going to take me a while to explain this, every little thing, but just know that using this calculator is extremely fast. It should take no more than two minutes to do everything. And that's just one more thing you can check off when you're on site. Also, um, and I guess ideally you wouldn't even have to use this on site. You would do all this before you even got onto the job site. Um, okay, so our example room here, uh, 50 feet long by 32 feet wide uh, by 12 feet high. Um, it's going to give us a volume of uh, 19,200 feet, cubic feet. Uh, surface area of 5,168 feet squared. Uh, this mean free path is going to be just under 15 feet, 14.8, uh, which is eh, it's kind of small for a ballroom, actually. Um, Critical frequency, uh, which is what we're really looking for here, is going to be 114 hertz. So what that means is that basically below 114 hertz, you're going to get a lot of buildup 
excess buildup of energy down there, which could mean feedback. It could mean speech intelligibility issues. Uh, it could mean all kinds of things. And then uh, above 114 hertz, for the most part, it's going to be more kind of diffuse. What the energy you uh, put into the room is going to be what you measure out of it. Um, the cutoff frequency, as we can see, is real low. It's like 11 hertz, so it's kind of not even within the audible range at this point. Um, and as we can see, like I mentioned earlier, about the highest axial mode, um, it's 282 hertz, which is odd because it's above the modal region. So how could there be a mode above the modal region? Well, just because, again, this mean free path is an average distance and the distance between the floor and the ceiling, which is 12 feet, is less than that. So therefore, uh, it's going to be a higher frequency where you're going to get a buildup. Um, so what I could say, like as a practical example, if you threw up a um, podium microphone or something, um, and this was the room I was working in, uh, I would be wary about like going to 280 hertz with the PEQ and and putting the gain up because you probably would get some sort of feedback there. It's not a, it's not a guarantee because it's all positional, but just know that there's an issue between your ceiling height there. That's going to affect your frequency response. Uh, okay, so this is the Room Sim uh, section of a piece of software called Room EQ Wizard. Um, definitely go and. Uh, and search this online. You can download it for free. It's an audio analyzer, and it has this room sim in it too. Um, it's a really great piece of software. I definitely recommend it for everybody. So what I did was I put the same um, example dimensions into this. Uh, so as you can see over here, 50 feet, 32 feet, 12 feet, same volume. Um, and here's our kind of uh, little visual of the subwoofer being here against the wall and this teeny tiny little guy is a little person's head. And that's that's what represents, oh, sorry, this frequency response here represents what you would hear at that position. So if you look, um, you can see there's, there's huge peaks and there's huge nulls um, <clears throat> down low here in the frequency in this room. And that's, that's what we expect to see um, because like like we said before, uh, the wavelengths are kind of interacting and either building up or canceling themselves out. And then as as we kind of move up in frequency here, up and up and up and up and up, we hit 114 hertz, which was our our calculated critical frequency. And yeah, you can you can sort of see that at this point and above it, uh, the comb filtering here um, gets much more narrow and less deep and less high. And that is a visual representation of the transition between a modal uh, field and a diffuse field. And it's, again, it's not exact. It's just a, a good general area, a good starting point. So here we come to the, my favorite part, because behind all the theory, like, What's the practical application of this? Why why am I finding this information out? And the reason is, um, for speech systems, which is what I work a lot with, often the desired result is to not excite the room modes, everything below 114 hertz in this example, because that can cause speech intelligibility issues. So you have two options, really. One is to just EQ the energy in the modal region well, EQ it out um, and never excite it in the first place. Um, and two is to put up a lot of bass traps. Good luck with number two. Uh, maybe in your, in your uh, you know, production suite at home, but uh, you know, and on a job site, it's probably not going to happen. Um, so what I like to do um, is if I can get the dimensions of the room I'm going to be in beforehand, which a lot of times I can. I'll run it through this calculator. I'll open up my uh, console, excuse me, my console editor. And what I'll do is I'll take a high, high pass filter on all of like the lav mics and definitely the handheld mics for Q&A. 
uh, we have these uh, little square wireless mics called catch boxes that you, they've got an accelerometer in them. You can throw them all around the room and, um, and people use them for Q and a, it's kind of a fun thing. So lav mics, handhelds, catch boxes, uh, podium mic things, things, things that are just going to be used for speech. Um, odds are you're going to want to excite none of the modal region if you can help it. Um, as far as the highest action mode, 284 Hertz, eh, don't, don't cut that out. I mean, that, that's right in the, in speech zone. Um, but what, what I'll do is, is take a, take an EQ in the, the console editor, throw the high pass filter at 114 and, uh, and that'll be a good starting point. Now I'm not saying you should just put it there and then get into the room and not list like, obviously people's voices are different and things are slightly different from calculation in real life all the time anyway, but it's a really good starting point. I mean, if you're ever wondering like, Oh, you know, where should I, where should I high pass filter this? Well, that that's, that's your answer. Um, okay. And then, so there's another practical application, which is literally just the opposite. In some cases, uh, you might want to purposely excite the room modes. Um, so one example is uh, a while back I had a movie night uh, at the Rhode Island Convention Center, and the sales rep, uh, sales rep, God love him, only sent me with four 10-inch active speakers for playback. So what I did, I ran the critical frequency uh, C calculation to the calculator. Instead of a high-pass filter, uh, I put a low shelf EQ filter. Um, excuse me, with the knee. Uh, of the filter at the critical frequency, whatever it was. And I boosted it like 9, 10 dB. And uh, it's funny, you, you walking in there, you would swear that there was subwoofers in that room because you all that buildup energy, it's, it's literally free energy that just, just completely just goes nuts. And since there's no live microphones, it was just movie playback. Um, there was you know practically no limit to it. And this is actually... A picture of the room um, that I was in. So, um, as you can see, like this this weird drop ceiling here. I'm pretty sure what I did was. It's nice enough that it has this cutout here. I'm pretty sure I lasered through that drop ceiling and, and went to the structural ceiling, and that's how I found everything. Um, but for the most part, it's it's mostly a, a rectangle room, so it worked out. Uh, okay, so section two. Uh, this is the aspect ratio to coverage angle section. Um, there's kind of two uh, thoughts behind this. Um, one would be if you're designing a sound system to go in somewhere um, and you're doing this beforehand and you have access to like whatever you want to bring in, um, this will tell you exactly what you need to, to fit in that space. And then on the other hand, um, say you're a freelancer and you didn't do your due diligence and tried to advance the, the job and ask what equipment you're going to be using, specifics about it and stuff. Or say you couldn't and you showed up on site and you're in, a, in the, the production manager says, all right, this is your breakout room. You've got X, X, and X speakers. Uh, make it work. So what you can do. Uh, with this is, again, the, all this is going to be calculated by that initial length, width, and height that you already put in. So um, it's going to give you a couple different scenarios. Um, the first one would be a speaker facing down the length of the room. Um, so a single speaker facing the long way. Uh, this Actually, this forward aspect ratio title should be over here. That's my mistake. But this is their forward aspect ratio. And with that, those dimensions, it's 1.56. Uh, and then this talks about your coverage angle. So what? So if I have a 1.56 ratio room, what coverage angle do I need to fit that room perfectly? And the answer is 79.58 degree speaker. Obviously, those don't, don't exist. But if you had an 80 degree speaker, it'd be fine. Uh, the other scenario is one, one speaker facing down the width. Uh, and then it just goes on and on. Two speakers facing down the length, four speakers width. Two speakers with. These are just the most common uh, scenarios that I deal with. Um, so that's why I have them coded, coded in there. Um, so the next uh, page, we'll, we'll see an example of that. So we've got our 50 foot deep room by 32 feet wide. 
Um, I've got a single 80 degree speaker uh, in the center of its coverage angle, uh, coverage area, sorry. And as you can see, it fits perfectly because our um, line of minimum variance uh, unity line is exactly halfway down the coverage uh, depth. And then if you look here, uh, you from from our unity line to the back of the room, it changes two colors, which represents 60 B of drop. So you, you've got no more than 60 B of drop to the back of the room. So that's how we know it's matched uh, at AK. And uh, if we want to look at two speakers um, facing down the width of the room, uh, it's calling for 102 degrees. This is two 100 degree speakers. And as you can see, it fits quite nicely. Um, so before I move on, one thing to uh, consider about this, um, this section is predicated on the thought that the speaker will always need to be in the center of its coverage zone. So like we, when we had one, it's going to be in the middle of the room. If we have two, it's going to be divided by two. If we had four, it's going to be divided by uh, four. Um, so it'll tell you based on the speaker always being in the center of its coverage area, uh, if a different angle will work or not. But what it won't tell you um, is how to space something else to make it work. Um, so let me, uh, let me go deeper into that. Um, so let's say you had this room. Uh, it says that you need a 102 degree speaker to fit but you only have a 110 degree speaker to work with. Well, it's going to tell you that it's going to be, it's, so it's going to overshoot a little bit because it's, it's wider, um, but it's only wider by like half a dB. So it's going to pass. You get uh, like a fudge factor uh, of up to 3 dB um, before it will tell you that you should probably think about using something else. Um, but again, it's only gonna it's only deciding this based on specific placement of the speaker center of the coverage area. So same same example down here. Um, if I only had a sixty degree speaker to work with, it's gonna give you a fail because there's over a three dB gap um, to the walls or to the edges of the boundaries. So basically, remember anywhere there's like a gray or a uh, a blue box, that's where your variable goes in. Okay, so this is the third section. Um, and this is called the inverse square law. It's um, fairly simple. And um, the thing you need to remember with this is when it's asking for near and far, near seat, far seat, or wherever person in the audience is going to be, if they're standing, it doesn't matter. Um, but you're measuring from the source itself. So you're going to want to stick your laser measure on the speaker and lays that first seat, and that's your near, and then lays the far seat, and that's your far. But remember, it's coming from the speaker each time. So the SBL uh, drop section is going to use the inverse square law, and this is going to help you predict the amount of level drop between two points in the room. The inverse square law says that the sound intensity from a source uh, behaves in an analogous fashion and that every time the distance from a sound source is doubled, uh, the intensity reduces by a factor of four. Uh, for us as practical engineers, um, just know that what that equates to is a 60 dB drop in SPL with every doubling of distance. And this is in the free field. So what you're going to find is that speakers in rooms, um, especially in the low frequencies, uh, is not going to drop quite as much over space, but this is a good, um, it's a good, uh, think of it as like uh, a way of deciding whether you will need delay speakers or not. Um, again, this has, <clears throat> excuse me, this has kind of a fudge factor built into it. I guess a tolerance built into it. Um, if the first seat, we'll say, was 16 feet and the farthest seat was 40, um, that's a ratio of 2.5 to 1, so it's going to give you a pass, um, and the pass means 
you probably don't need to delay speaker to get back to that 40 all the way back to the back it's going to drop 8 db it's it's a little much it's a little lot it's just past spec but you can probably get away with it um now however if the farthest seat is 65 feet um it's going to be four to one and 12 db a drop you'll need a delay speaker um, for sure for the, something like that uh, okay, so this is the last section. Um, it's a reverb calculator, uh, Norris Iring formula. Um, now, this really only takes one additional variable on top of the length, length, and height of the room. But it's a little bit, you just got to know what you're doing with this. Um, so what you do is, uh, I've included this link here. And this is a link of uh, absorption coefficients for like common building materials. Um, it's it's in the README section of the uh, the calculator too. When you click on it, it's going to bring you to this website. Oops. And um, basically, it's going to give you an answer for reverb time, but only at one frequency. You can recalculate for a different frequency, um, but it's only one at a time. And it's looking for an average, average. So the, the most common example is that basically four walls are going to be made of, we'll say sheetrock, and the ceiling is made of whatever, wood joists or something, and maybe the floor is concrete. Well, in order to kind of to get an average uh, for the room that describes the room, uh, We'll look it up. We'll say um, concrete at 1K is a 0 0.02. Um, so we'll say 0 0.02 uh, plus whatever the coefficient would be for sheetrock or drywall. Um, and then we'll say wood on joists for uh, the ceiling, 0 0.07. So you would take wh whatever material is unique. Um, Add that up and then divide by however many unique materials there were. A little bit, a little bit convoluted, um, but we'll say 0 0.02 for the floor plus uh, 0 0.07 uh, for the ceiling, and we'll say sheetrock is 0 0.1 uh, plus 0 0.1, and then take those three and divide it. Whatever that answer is, divide it by three, and that's that's going to describe your uh, average absorption coefficient for the whole room. Um, my example here is not what I just said, but I made it up. But this is an, an, just another example. So if the whole thing ended up being 0.16, that's going to give you a reverb time of one second uh, at, at whatever frequency that is. Um, now that's going to change uh, definitely once like the audience shows up. And uh, keep in mind that this, you know, it's kind of a it's kind of a general equation it's not super super um precise you would obviously want to uh, compare this to what you're getting on your audio analyzer as well um but it's a good starting again it's a good starting point if you've never been in the room before and you happen to know that like the the Pawtucket armory that i worked in is all stone um you know i knew the dimensions i could uh figure out the absorption coefficients for stone and concrete, and then it would give me some sort of an idea of what I'm walking into. Um, whether I can do something about it or not is is beyond this, but at least I know that, you know, I'm definitely going to need delay speakers and stuff like that. Um, I think that was everything I wanted to talk about with that. Um, yeah, so... The other things that this calculator will also give you uh, with this variable put in there is uh, something called the room constant, uh, critical distance, uh, reflections per second, and the critical distance versus your um, actual distance ratio that you typed in on the uh, SPL drop section earlier. So I'll just define some of these terms and then I'll, I'll explain them. Uh, so the room constant is the acoustic state of the room that is used to predict uh, reverberant field SPL and the ratio of direct to reverberant sound. It 
you can ignore it. it. It doesn't have anything to do with anything on its own. Uh, it's just used to create to calculate the critical distance. And the critical distance um, is the distance away from a source in that specific room uh, where the reverberant level, uh, all, all the reflections off the walls and everything, equals the direct sound level. And um, and this will be helpful going forward. Uh, reflections per second is just a, a density. It, it's just showing you how much um, how much is going on. Uh, let's see. Again, actual distance uh, is going to be the total distance from point A to point B that you entered in the SPL drop section. Um, so what you want to do is compare this to the critical distance. Um, and that would kind of give you an idea of your direct to reverberant ratio for whatever span you entered. Um, and the ratio that I talked about, it can be used just to double check how many sources you need uh, for more direct sound. So an example, let's say uh, the near seat was 16 feet, uh, the far seat was 65 feet. Um, in this example, uh, okay, well, that's actually 24 feet's not right for that, but let's just say that, um, let's just say that that span was 24 feet. Well, that span of 24 feet is 5.4 times the critical distance, which means you're, you're into just reverberant level five times more than your direct, your direct sound. Um, so that in and of itself, it's just another indication, hey, I should probably get a, a delay speaker up to get some more direct sound back to this back. Um, and uh, th this is all based on the fact that in this room, in this example room, the critical distance is only four feet away, well, 4.4 feet away from a source. And one thing that I did not code into this, um, that I just want to touch on because it might be useful. If we remember this span uh, back here is uh, from the source each time and the critical distance works the same way. So what I coded in here is what will drop over this span. But what you might want to look at is the far seat uh, in and of itself, compare that to the critical distance. If it's 65 feet, compare that to 4.42 feet. And that's your total loss like in the entire room, not just the span of seating. So one day I'll calculate, I'll code that in there, but for now, uh, just know that. And um, and that pretty much does it. Oh yeah, second disclaimer. So we talked, uh, about um, in the in the beginning about the room mode section, how the critical uh, frequency kind of defines the transition point between a modal uh, region of frequencies and diffuse. Uh, what you cannot do with the reverb time calculator is you can't use the data uh, calculated for a frequency lower than the critical frequency because it'll give you a value but it's not going to be accurate because all the reverb time formulas are based on the uh, assumption that you're working in a diffuse sound field um, so again it'll give you an, it'll give you an answer in this example if i tried to find the reverb time of 80 hertz i'll give you an example but you just ignore it. it's not going to be right um, because all the all that math is based on uh, diffuse sound field. Um, so I know this was this was long long explanation. Um, again, just remember that this thing is super quick to use, um, even on site. Um, it's you know just get your measurements and figure out what speakers you're working with, and you're probably good to go. Um, so it's available here on my uh, Marathon Audio. Uh, web page on LinkedIn. Um, if you go to the about page, uh, you can just copy. They don't for some reason LinkedIn doesn't allow hyper hyperlinks, so you just have to copy 
the um, Google Drive link and paste it into your browser and it'll send you right to it. Um, what I will say is um, please download it. You can save it whatever you want, <laughs> whatever name you want, I don't care. Um, and you may have to hit enable editing, um, but don't, don't ask for permission to edit it because that is an option through the Google system. Uh, I'm just gonna ignore it. I'm not gonna answer that because if, if you think about it, if I let anybody edit it as it is up on the um, cloud, then the next person that downloads it, it's, it could be messed up or something. So in order to use it, just download it, save it whatever you want, click enable editing and go to town, um, but don't ask to, uh, to edit it. Um, so that's it. Uh, I hope you can find it useful. Um, I know I use it quite a bit. Um, I actually have like a pretty decent database um, because what I'll do is I will save, I will use the title, save as in the title of the sheet uh, as the name of the ballroom in the venue. So I have one called like room mode calculator master template or whatever. And then say I'm at the Newport Marriott ballroom, salons A through C. Well, I'll save it as Newport Marriott ballroom, salons A through C. Uh, and then that way, the next time I go down to Newport and I have to work in that, um, in that hotel, I can just pop it up and I don't have to measure the room again. It's just, it's right there in the database. And you know, it's an Excel file, it's tiny. They're like kilobytes big. They don't take up any space. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's about it. Um, if you want uh, to find out more about me, I guess you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, if you have any, oh, we'll do we'll do a quick Q and A here. Uh, if you have any questions or anything uh, later on, um, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, as long as like it looks like a legit profile, I'll, I'll accept it. You can there's messaging there. You can email me at any time. Mike at marathonaudiosystems dot com. Um, I I'll, I'll answer any questions um and yeah so uh what do you think jacob is there anything in the chat i think you're muted here we go um yes oh one question will this be available for re replay mike is recording it and i am going to try to edit it uh or we'll, we'll talk and see who's going to do it but yeah we're, we're going to edit it down um, to be a continuous thing. Uh, I know we had a little bit of a technical difficulty and some people didn't a weren't able to join the second portion until we got into it. So we are going to try to make it available um, probably on YouTube. I think we have the, the Boston AES YouTube page, at least for yeah. audio builders workshop. So we can, we'll make that available and I can send it out to uh, everyone who got a ticket for the event. Um, also on the, online event page, I put a link to the calculator in case you want to uh, get it there. Yeah, so we're definitely gonna gonna make this available. We're also going to probably, well, I as long as we'll, we have the upload time, we're gonna put a last week's event with Adam Ann online as well for, for replay and being able to watch that. Are there any other questions about the uh, about the calculator itself or applications for it? Anything about the way Mike uses it? Oh, here. Speaking earlier about delay speakers, is there a way to calculate how many milliseconds you would want that delay speaker to be? Yes, Matthew, there sure is. Um, that's beyond the scope of what this can do. Um, you can do that two ways. And uh, the sort of close enough to get it done and move on to other things way is to use that laser measure that you're assume, pr presumably already using for like this calculator. Um, and you'd stand where you want to align the two speakers in time, the, the main and the delay, which would usually be like directly on axis with the main, but all the way in the back. Um, and lays the main and get the distance and lays the, and don't move, but just pivot and lays the delay speaker. Um, and then you got to convert that to, to milliseconds uh, or the distance to milliseconds, which is usually just timing the, the difference in distance by 0.9. Again, kind of just, I'm not going to say janky, but it's just, it's not exact, but it's close. And then add that delay to the closer speaker, which would be the delay. So that 
the problem with that is if they're two different types of speakers and they're active or something, you don't know what, what time delay processing is going on in, in both boxes. Um, so you can't be sure that what you entered with the distance offset is going to be right. The, the, re the real way to do it is to use a, um, an audio analyzer and either run a sign sweep or pink noise, capture that impulse response in the same spot. Like where you would laze, you just throw up a microphone, uh, capture the main, capture the uh, delay separately. And that's going to tell you no matter how much processing and latency is going on in those boxes, doesn't matter. It's going to give you the exact end uh, result and then, then you do the math from there um, and as a matter of fact if you want to try this yourself uh, like I said earlier Google Room EQ wizard and that is a free audio analyzer that will allow you to to do that um, so yeah hope that helps very cool do you have any other any other questions Doesn't seem like we do. Um, I'll just cool. say a few quick things about uh, upcoming AES events. We don't have dates for them yet. We're about to nail them down. Uh, but we have three events that are going to be coming up within the next couple months. One is going to be a panel on acoustics, specifically talking about small room acoustics in relation to working at home. I know with, uh, with the coronavirus happening, a lot of us are away from our nice studios and facilities. So we're gonna talk a little bit about what you can do to get your space at home uh, a little bit better for working with audio. We're also gonna be doing a panel on forensic audio and repair, which will be really cool. And we're also going to be doing a Q&A with Joel Hamilton from Studio G. So we should have, uh, have some dates for those soon. We'll be sharing that on the AES Facebook page and also on the Boston AES newsletter. And uh, again, just to, well, once we have our recording uh, of this edited, we'll post that online and send it out to everyone who got a ticket for this and also probably do a blast to all of the, uh, the newsletter subscribers as well. So yeah, stay updated. Um, we'll, we have some cool stuff coming up. Any other final questions? No. Uh, I think I see one, Raishi. Are there any additional benefits to SonarWorks reference? Uh, or is the RumiQ wizard all we need? Uh, I'm actually not familiar with SonarWorks reference. Never used it, never actually heard of it. Do you, have you heard of it, Jacob? Yeah, so um, I believe that they do different things. So RoomEQ Wizard, to my knowledge, it just takes measurements of your room and it provides useful information uh, from those measurements that you took. But it doesn't actually adjust filters or do correction, correct? Yes, exactly, yep. Okay, yeah, so Sonar works has something like Rumi Q Wizard built into it. It does the analysis, but it also applies corrections, in frequency, and time domain. Okay. It's a really cool tool. Um, I use it for headphones. Um, I haven't done the uh, the speaker version. But uh, yeah, Room Rumi Q Wizard is for analysis only. So you can use that knowledge to sort of DIY your own sonar works. Um, exactly. But uh, Which... yeah, it gives you the information. Yeah, and that that's gonna take you. You'll need some sort of processor to actually do that. I mean, I don't know if there's a software solution, but I mean, in my studio, I have a an open architecture DSP that I picked up on eBay for not much money. And using Rumi Q Wizard, I was able to get all the data, you know, to to, to set the um, the crossover filters and uh, set the delay for the sub so that it phase aligned at my uh, mix position and everything. Um, so yeah, I mean, I I don't know anything about the SonarWorks, but I mean, try it. Yeah, see see what it see what it sounds like. Um, but I don't know if it's free. Groomy Q Wizard is def definitely free. And it works well. 